Father, thank you for the word of God today. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. May we hide it in our hearts so we don't sin against you. And I pray, God, that you'll give us illumination, understanding. Open our minds to the word of God. Make, help it to make sense to us. And, God, I just pray that above all things, as we get revelation in it, may we not just get revelation, but let us walk in obedience to it. And, Father, above everything, may the name of Jesus be lifted high and exalted, for it's in his holy name we pray. Let everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you want to know where to turn, turn to the book of Romans. You say, well, Pastor, where? I don't care anywhere. Because wherever you turn, we'll probably be talking about it. We're going to cover a lot of ground from the book of Romans today. We're continuing our series, Got Purpose. And the subtitle for today is Living a Surrendered Life. I really, really felt like uh, the Spirit of God wanted me to go in this direction. And as I've been reading the New Testament this past week, one-year Bible reading, you know, the book of Romans, tremendous book. Uh, it's a book of doctrine. It's a foundational book for the Christian faith. Gets into a lot of different things, which are great. I love the passages there. I just felt like I wanted to take the entire book and use it as a template for living a surrendered life because Paul talks about it pretty much in depth. And we're going to break it down, try to make it simple and something for you to grasp, get a hold of, and live out in your life this coming week. So um, I could have gone down the direction of talking specifics about purpose and I thought, you know what, there are principles to living a life of purpose. That if we don't get the principles down, we can talk about all the specifics all we want, but we'll be missing it if we don't have these essential fundamentals down. So that's kind of how I'm approaching this and believing that as I do, and you embrace these truths, that as you begin walking these out, purpose for you will become more clear. I'll address some of it in the message, but I want you to be able to discover yourself what the Lord is calling you to do on this planet. And every single one of us has purpose. And the reason it's important for us to discover what that is is because if we live without purpose, we live aimlessly. And we're like nomads wandering through the earth and we don't really know what God has called us to do and we don't live a targeted life. Therefore, we do a lot of stuff. It's good stuff, but it'll stress you out because you're doing a lot of good things that sound good and that people have invited you to do or people you, you know, have, they're good thoughts, good causes. But if you do every good thing, you'll do nothing. You'll end up doing nothing and you'll be spread so thin you'll just get burned out and you'll get stressed out. But if you live a focused life by knowing what God has called you to do, you'll be able to say no to the good things and yes to the best things in your life. And by the way, let me just say this. Your best thing is different from somebody else's best thing. Just because you're not engaged in their thing doesn't mean you don't believe in their thing. It's just you're not called to their thing. You're called to your thing, to what God has purposed for you, how God has wired you. And how many of you know we're all wired differently, right? Amen? And so we want to discover that purpose for us. So let's begin. I'm going to give you a couple of points. We're going to start in Romans 1. We'll go all the way to 16. And I'll share some things, principles in between. There are several of them. First, principle number one is I am not ashamed of the gospel. To live out your purpose, we're going to start here. Because in Romans 1, verse 16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation. The gospel, the good news, gospel means good news. Good news of what? Jesus Christ coming to this earth. That good news has the power to change a person's life. You should be an example of that, right? And it's the power of God for salvation to whom? Everyone. It's for everyone. This good news is for all. To everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, meaning the gospel message, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. 
as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So we start with the I'm not ashamed of the gospel, meaning you embrace the good news for yourself personally. This I'm not ashamed is a two-pronged approach to life. It really means that you embrace the good news for yourself, meaning you receive salvation for your own life, but then it means that when you are out in the world, you're not ashamed of the gospel either, okay? That you are always ready to share your faith. Did you know in Ephesians 6, the armor of God, part of it is having your feet shod. Now listen to the terminology in Ephesians 6. You know about the armor of God, right? I taught you a couple weeks ago in the prayer, in the Lord's Prayer. Real quick, the armor of God is having on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But the feet shod, notice, it's not just having your feet clothed with the gospel, but your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? A readiness to share the gospel of Jesus. You remember when Jesus said these words? He said, those of you who lose your life will save it. But if you save your life, you'll lose it. What did he mean by that? I believe that it is inherent within this concept of not being ashamed of the gospel. You see, when you and I live our life exposed as a Christian, we're not ashamed of it. We're not ashamed to share our faith. We're not ashamed to share Jesus. The minute you, listen to me, folks, the minute you cross the line to let somebody else know that you are a believer and you begin to share your faith, do you know that at that moment you lose yourself? When you try to shield the fact that you're a believer and you don't want anybody else to know it and you kind of hide behind that, you're saving your life. You're not risking anything. You're not exposing anything. But the minute that you share your faith, you're identifying with Christ. Did you know the song we sang earlier about, you know, Jehovah Nissi, you fight our battles, right? By the way, I love that song. I, I told the first service, I felt like I was back in Africa. That song has an African vibe to it. You know, that one section, Jehovah Nissi, fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh, meet your need. Yeah. You know, by the way, I get to go back to Africa in October. I'm looking forward to my visit. I get to go back and uh, get that rich African soil under my feet that I love so much. Yeah. Jehovah. Yeah, I know. I'm rocking. I get it. Right. <laughs> Pastor, you're rocking. I get it. Hey, Pastor rocks, man. Yeah, I'm rocking. Okay. But Jehovah Nissi, fight your battle. Jehovah Nissi, do you know what the name Jehovah Nissi means? The Lord our banner. Do you know what a banner is? Not only do you use that when you fight, you know, as you, you're, you're underneath of that banner, but the children of Israel, the book of Numbers, when they set out of their encampment, they each had a banner that said what tribe they belonged to. Okay? Tribe, of, whoa, by the way, let me give you a quick test here. Moses arranged the order of the, of the procession for them to break camp and go out. Who was the first tribe that led the, all of Israel out? Judah. What does the name Judah mean? Okay. You need to let Judah lead your life. You need to let praise be in the forefront of your life. You need to let worship be one of the first things you do. Amen? Amen. Uh, that's just a side issue, okay? But what they did was when they had the banner raised, it identified them with the tribe they belonged to, okay? Teams have banners, right? 
They have insignias. They have mascots. They have whatever. It says who you identify with. Jehovah Nissi does not only mean the Lord fights your battles. Jehovah Nissi means this is who I identify with. I identify my life with Jesus Christ who is Lord and Jehovah God. This is my, my life is hidden, the Bible says in the New Testament, hidden with Christ in God. So when you are not ashamed and you expose your life to be lived for him and you let your light, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, you let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Immediately you're losing your life and you're identifying with Jesus and saying, I belong to him. Right then and there, you are open for scrutiny, rejection, or acceptance. You don't know where it's going to go. You don't know what direction, but immediately you're saying, my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm going to share Jesus no matter the result, the repercussion, no matter what comes back on me because he's my banner. I identify with him. Do you understand what I mean? So when we say I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's not only a personal embrace, but it is a public exposure of your faith to those who need him. Okay? So after we leave this Romans 1, 16, 17 passage, over the next couple of chapters, Paul kind of unpacks this. And he tells us later on in chapter 1 that God's judgment is on those who forsake him in verses 18 to 32. But then he goes on in chapter 2, verse 4, and he says, it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. God is going to take some good things to bring you to faith in him. It's not always tragedy. It's not always misfortune. It's not always the negative, although those things can be used as well. But if we allow it, the goodness of God, the mercy of God will bring us to repentance. Then Romans 3.23 declares, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why every one of us need to embrace this gospel and not be ashamed of it. Because all of us have sinned. This message is for everyone. And then he tells us in chapter 5, verse 1, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is an essential, powerful doctrine that we need to understand. We are justified by faith. What does the word justified mean? It means declared not guilty. So in the court of heaven... We are declared not guilty. And this is fundamental to what Paul's going to get into, and I'll get into it in a few minutes, about what our faith rests in. It doesn't rest in us. It rests in the work of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross. We are declared not guilty by faith in him. So we don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. And listen, if you're here today and you're living on the edge, you're watching online, and you're not fully surrendered to the Lord Jesus. You know what I mean by that. During the week, you live your own life. You do your own thing. You make your own decisions. But when you live a surrendered life, he's Lord. He's master. He's the one that you look to. He's the one that guides and directs your life. You've got a lot of things in your own heart. And the Bible says that in the book of Proverbs. Many are the thoughts and things that are in a man's heart, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand, okay? So when you get these thoughts and these plans that you want to put in your own heart and in your own life and enact, if you live a surrendered life, you're going to take those things and give them to the Lord and say, God, your will be done. See, that's the prayer of a surrendered life. Not my will, your will be done. But if it's always your will, you're not living a surrendered life. So right now, before I go any further in this message, We're going to pray, and if you need Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life where you live, surrender to him, we're going to pray right now. And those of you watching online, you could pray this with me as well. I want you to pray this after me. Say, Dear God, I come humbly before you in the name of Jesus, realizing I'm lost without you. I need you in my life. I surrender my life to you, Lord Jesus, asking you to forgive me. For every sin I've ever committed, come into my life, wash me, cleanse me, and be my Lord and Savior in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord thanks and praise. So a surrendered life is a faith-powered life. 
Remember in that passage I shared with you, Paul said, the righteous live by faith. It's faith powered. If you're waiting for everything to become known to you before you act, you're going to be sitting still a long time. You walk by faith. There are a lot of things you and I don't understand. We don't see. We don't grasp. We, Paul said we know in part. And so we don't know everything, right? So we walk by faith. We trust God that he's leading and directing us. That is a surrendered life. It's a faith-powered life. And purpose begins with salvation. That's why I just led you in that prayer. Because real purpose in God starts there. Now, once you have embraced this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, both personally for salvation, and then you are going to be a light in this world, you have to recognize, secondly, second principle, is that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. That means your body now. Because when you die, when I die, the, Bi- the Bible tells us that we're going to receive a new body. It will be made like his body, like the body of Jesus. That's what the New Testament teaches. But right now we're in this mortal body. But guess what? Because the Spirit of God lives in us, it's the Spirit of God that energizes us. It's the Spirit of God that is able to flow in us. And watch this. He'll give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. The Spirit of God is meant to take up residence in you. The Spirit of God is meant to be in charge now of your life. He dwells in you. And he goes on to say in Romans 8, several principles following This, that the Spirit of God dwells in you. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, in verse 14 of chapter 8, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They're the children of God. This is a prayer that I pray regularly just about every day of my life. Lord, help me to be led by your Spirit. Help me to be led by your Spirit. Help me to hear your voice. Help me to see, not with natural eyes, but see what I need to see in the Spirit. And help me to be led by the Spirit of God. Because I don't want my flesh in control. I want the Spirit of God to lead me and direct me. Because the Spirit of God knows what the will of the Father is. The Spirit of God knows the direction my life needs to take. And what do I need to do? I need to cultivate my relationship with Him so I hear His voice more clearly. You know, the the more you are in tune with somebody's voice the more you have a sensitivity to that voice where you don't even need to see the person. You can just hear them on the phone and identify who they are. Are you hearing me? The more you engage with the Holy Spirit, the more sensitive you'll be to hear his voice and you'll be able to know that's God speaking to me. That's God directing me. That is God leading me. The Spirit of God, I wrote this in my devotional earlier this week that I post online every day. The Spirit of God helps us, according to chapter 8, verse 26. I am so grateful for the help of the Holy Spirit, and I'm not ashamed to admit I need His help every day of my life. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose, right? So I've got the Spirit of God now working in every area of my life. Even the negative things that come to me, God will turn it around and cause it to work for my good, for my benefit. I'll learn something. My character will be shaved and and will be molded and to become more like Jesus. God will take these things and make them work for good. And then Romans 8.31 says, if God be for me, who can be against me? That's the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And then it goes on to say in in chapter 8, verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall angels, demons, principalities, powers, things present, things to come? No, none of these things, trials, tribulations, negative, whatever it is, nothing will separate me from the love of God. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And then finally, chapter 8, verse 37 says, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not only are we victorious, but we're more than victorious. That's the power of the Holy Spirit that is working on our behalf 
to cause us to be more than conquerors. Aren't you grateful for that? So a surrendered life is a spirit-led life. And our purpose is fueled by the Holy Spirit. That's why I need him every day of my life. The third principle in the book of Romans for purpose is we cannot pursue a relationship with God based on works. Now, this is something that Paul had to deal with several times in the New Testament in, with different churches. Why? Because they got excited about beginning their life in the Spirit. And here's how it goes in modern day, how it happens. And it happened in Bible days as well. So you begin your life in the Spirit. Man, you're excited. Man, you're, you know, you're pumped up. Oh, this is great. You know, you begin serving God. And then God begins to bless you. You go, oh, man, this is great. God's blessing me. And then God begins to use you. You go, wow, this is fantastic. The Lord's using me. And somewhere after that, people's tendency is to begin to move in pride and think that it's them. They forget that the Holy Spirit is fueling them. The Holy Spirit has led them. And what's really happened is they have just matured in their gifts and being used by God and understanding the things of God. And so they get comfortable with that and they begin to hear other people and the applause of individuals, and they start thinking, yeah, I am pretty good at this. Yeah, I can do this at a drop of a hat. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is one. And you begin doing that, and now, all of a sudden, things are no longer based on faith, but based on works and based on how good you can do things. Well, there, you know, that's called religion. If I do certain things. So in other words, there are people that feel good. You feel good about being in church today. And you should feel good. You're in the house of God. God bless you. You made a great choice first day of the week. But I want to just give you a little piece of news. Being in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than you walking in your garage makes you a car. Okay? You have to experience the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that works in you. And through, It's not by good works. It's not by all the things that you do. Now watch this. Paul addresses this in Romans 9 verse 31. He says, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not exceed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. They thought they could achieve the righteousness that was spoken to them by the law. Living out, the, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. And when Jesus came and was living in this earth, the religion that had evolved to that day was just set up on all kinds of works. You see it when you read the Gospels and you read what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these laws and all these things that they enacted that believed that was what made you righteous before God. And they lost the fact that it was faith. Faith that caused them to be righteous before God. Paul goes on in Romans 10 and he shares with us this, the simplicity of the gospel, okay, that it's not based on works. But he says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10 verse 9 and forward, okay. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Yeah, but don't I have to? No. Yeah, but shouldn't I? No. See, this was the cry of Martin Luther for the Reformation. It's called faith alone. Just faith. It's not about your works, not by works of righteousness which we have done, the New Testament says. But according to his mercy, he saved us. It's not by your works. 
It's not by how many times you go to church. It's not by how many good things you've done. It's not by how much tithe and offering you can give. It's not by how many things you can, ministries you can get involved in and serve. It is by faith alone in the blood of Jesus Christ that you and I are saved. Faith alone, faith alone. And then he goes on to say in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why the preaching is important and that's why you involved in Bible reading, the one-year Bible, you know, I preach it over and over again. But getting in the one-year Bible. Why? Because as you consume the scriptures, you are fueling your faith. It is igniting faith in you. And you and I, ladies and gentlemen, young people, we need more than ever to have an ignition of faith in our lives because in this world, if all you have is outside input and you don't get any spiritual input, to not only offset that but cancel that, then you're going to be subject to the mores of the world and the thoughts of the world and the pressure of the world, which Paul deals with here in the next principle that I want to share with you. So a surrendered life is a faith-based life. And purpose is perpetuated by faith. You won't discover purpose in God aside from faith. Let me just pause to just give you a little nugget here. Part of your purpose has within it a component of something that is supernatural, that is beyond you. Because if you could accomplish it, You wouldn't need God. You wouldn't need to rely on the Holy Spirit. But God will call you to a purpose that is bigger than you. You can't accomplish it on your own. You don't have the resources personally to do it. And you might even have to question, how is this going to happen? How is this going to be fulfilled? Okay? That's a good place to be. Because you have to depend on him to bring it to pass. Okay? So important. So purpose is perpetuated by faith. Next principle. Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed. If you're going to live out purpose, this is an important principle to grasp. Romans 12. Okay? Let's read it. Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. I love Moffat's translation of this scripture. You've heard me say it over the years. Moffat's translation of this says, do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. Okay, that's what this means. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, I need... To not allow the world to squeeze me into its mold. And instead, I need to be transformed in the way that I think. And when I do that, I will know what the will of God is for my life. Now, as I read this past week, Romans 12, I got to see a little bit deeper because Paul connects some things here in Romans 12 that I think are vital in discovering your purpose. And that is... If I'm going to live a transformed life, what is the evidence of that? How does that flesh out? If, it's, if, it, if it comes by me being transformed in the renewal of my mind, here's the point, folks. If your mind gets transformed, then what will follow is your behavior. Okay? The gospel teaches that. Jesus taught that. John the Baptist taught that. You have to first change your mind. That's called repentance. Once you change your mind, then your behavior will change. What religion attempts to do is change your behavior without your mind. This is called rules of do's and don'ts. That's religion. Relationship is no. I'm going to get God into my mind. I'm going to have this, my thoughts renewed. And then the the outflow of that will be the choices and decisions that I make. And one of those, Paul gets into immediately a couple of verses later. He says to us that we need to use our gifts, beginning in verse 6. He begins to list some gifts. 
And the evidence of a transformed life is to understand that you and I have gifts that the Holy Spirit has deposited in us, and we begin to use them. Why? Because a non-transformed life is an isolated, selfish life. Life is all about you. That's human nature. If you don't think that's human nature, let me take you. I could take you right now to where your little, precious, little children, three and four years old, are gathered in the nursery somewhere over there or in the toddler room or whatever and will look at your little angels beating some other kid upside the head because they don't want to share their toy with them because it's all about them. And you know what I'm talking about. And by the way, you're reaping some things that you've sown as a little toddler yourself. A life that is not transformed and surrendered is living for oneself. But when your life is transformed and changed, now your life becomes a life of servanthood to other people. And Paul said you got to use your gifts, and you got to use your gifts to minister to other people. Then he gets into a section that I just want to read to you that really shows the evidence of a transformed life. I'm going to use my one-year Bible for that. In Romans 12, beginning at verse 9, this is really, really powerful stuff. I'm going to just kind of, I'm going to try to refrain from commentary, but Paul goes down these bullet points of a transformed life. Here's what it is. Verse 9, don't just pretend that you love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong, stand on the side of the good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring others. Never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. Did you get that? Serve the Lord enthusiastically. I want everybody involved in ministry here to do it enthusiastically. If you're opening a door for someone, hey, it's great to see you in the house of the Lord today. If you're leading worship, do it enthusiastically. And I think we have some enthusiastic worship leaders here. If you're teaching, whatever you're doing, ushering, whatever it might be, let's do it enthusiastically. Well, I said I wasn't going to comment, but there you go. Be glad for all God is planning for you. Be patient in trouble and always prayerful. When God's children are in need, be the one to help them out. And get into the habit of inviting guests home for dinner. Wow. By the way, my favorite is macaroni and cheese, just in case you want <laughs> Or if they need lodging for the night. If people persecute you because you're a Christian, don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. When others are happy, be happy with them. If they're sad, share their sorrow. Live in harmony with each other. Don't try to act important. Or important, as some people say. But enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think... You know it all. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do your part to live in peace with everyone as much as possible. Dear friends, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God. For it is written, I will take vengeance, I will repay those who deserve it, says the Lord. Instead, do what the scriptures say. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink, and they will be ashamed of what they have done to you. Don't let evil get the best of you, but conquer evil by doing good. That is the word of the Lord. Say, Pastor, where was that? That is Romans 12, verse 9 through 21. 
I would encourage you to read that. So a surrendered life is a transformed life. And purpose connects you to something bigger. You know what my inspiration for that line of thought was? Purpose connects you to something bigger? My inspiration for that was driving through a Starbucks drive through this past week. I saw this sign at the register when I pulled up, and I pulled out my cell phone, and I took a picture of it real quick. It says, we're hiring, but notice the tagline underneath, connect with something bigger. Starbucks has it down. The church needs to get that. We're hiring. Come work for us so you can connect for, with something bigger. Really? Selling coffee? <laughs> Hear me. When you live a surrendered life and you begin to plug in and use your gifts, you're connecting to something bigger. You hearing what I'm saying? This message I'm hoping will spur you, inspire you to discover your gifts so that you will plug in here at Life Source somewhere, but then also plug in outside and be not ashamed of the gospel and let your light shine and your gifts be used out there so that you can connect to something bigger. And this coming month in August, we're going to be calling you to that as we prepare for the fall and what God's going to do. We need a lot of you to plug in and to get connected. Why? So that God's blessing can be on your life in a mighty, mighty, mighty way. Let me go to the last point. Last principle, Romans chapter 13. Live in love, not lust. If you're going to live out God's purpose, you must embrace living your life in love. Romans 13 verse 8 says, Owe no one anything except to love each other For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, shall not murder, shall not steal, shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, You know the time that the hours come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. See, a surrendered life says no to the flesh, says no to the drawings of this body of ours, and says yes to love and yes to the Spirit of the Lord being in control. The bottom line, and Romans talks about this really in depth when you go to chapters 6 and 7, talks about this pull, this tug of war between the flesh and the spirit. And you make the choice whether you let the flesh win or let whether you let the spirit win. It's choices, it's choices, it's choices, right? And you and I live those out. So let me summarize that point by saying a surrendered life is a love-filled life and purpose is motivated by love. Now, if I live this out, if I embrace this, if I walk in these principles, what's going to happen? Paul tells us in Romans 15, and this is the conclusion of the message today. When you live a surrendered life, you can expect four things to happen. Number one, the God of endurance and encouragement will flow through you. Here's the verse for it, Romans 15, verse 5. It says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. Now, what's interesting here in Romans 15, by the way, is it has these, these phrases, may the God of. And there's several things that he is the God of. One, he's a God of encur- endurance and encouragement so that we can live in harmony. Secondly, the God of hope will fill you 
Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. There's the fueling. It's the Holy Spirit that fuels me to do what? To be filled with joy and peace. Our prayer, Pastor Becky and I have been praying this. I prayed it on the way to church today, that God would fill you with his joy and his peace. If you need joy today, may God fill you. If you need peace today, may God fill your life. If there have been things disrupting your peace, disrupting your sleep at night, may that be gone in the name of Jesus. And I pray for the joy of the Holy Spirit, the peace of God to flood your life today in the name of Jesus. Don't worry about today. Jesus said don't worry about what's going on in your life but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he'll take care of everything else around you. That's a word for somebody today in Jesus name. (laughs) Thirdly he said the God of peace will be with you. Romans 15 33 said may the God of peace. Aren't you grateful he's a God of peace? He just talked about being filled with joy and peace. But may the God of peace be with you. Not only will he give you his peace, he'll give you himself. This is may the God of peace be with you. We have the God of peace walking with us. We have the God of peace that is, that is taking us on this journey. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us, but be with us always, even to the end of the earth, end of the age. He'll, he's with us. And finally, he said about this God of peace in Romans 16, verse 20, said, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I'm believing today that as we conclude the service in just a moment, that when we stand and as we begin to walk out of this building, that every step will be a step to crush Satan under our feet. Whatever it is that the enemy's been troubling you about, if he's been troubling your health, if he's been troubling your thoughts and your mind, if he's been troubling your family, your marriage, your kids, your grandchildren, if he's been troubling your business, if he's been troubling you in any way, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy so that nothing shall by any means hurt you. Do you believe that today? Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. May the God of peace crush the enemy under your feet. Amen. God is faithful, isn't he? Amen. Thank you for joining us at Life Source Church. We pray that today you found hope and freedom as you experienced the power and love of God. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please let us know by clicking the link in the comments below. Again, thank you for joining us and have an incredible week.